I would like to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Om Lakhani. He's a very good friend of mine, my colleague, my MBBS batchmate, and very dynamic and a brilliant uh, uh, physician currently working at uh, Jairus Hospital, Ahmedabad. Uh, he will be talking today about uh, uh, will AI take our jobs? Because if you see, uh, in lately we are having a lot of buzz in uh, AI space, particularly in technology and along with medicine also. So I would like to know more about where we are and uh, what we can do uh, in going forward. So before we uh, hand over this talk to Dr. Om, I would like to you know give a brief introduction about him. So he did uh, you know his MBBS from Broda Medical College. I uh, I was there with. Yeah. Almost five and a half years. He did his MD from Broda Medical College. He did uh, his uh, DM in endocrinology from uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital Delhi. So he's currently work at uh, Zydos Hospital as a consultant endocrinologist. He's a founder of uh, and Argument. He is a uh, developer of several apps in endocrinology. He is. Uh, also winner of President NB gold medal in endocrinology, uh, winner of two gold medals in MD and five gold medals in, uh, in MBBS. He published uh, almost 26 papers in various national and international journals and also wrote 15 book chapters in various uh, textbooks of endocrinology. So uh, without further ado, I would, uh, I would hand over to Dr. Om Lakhani so uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, good morning to this pleasant morning uh, where we are going to discuss something uh, different. And I thank uh, Dr. Gaurav for having me for this uh, interesting uh, discussion. So the topic today that we're going to discuss is will uh, artificial intelligence, AI, take our jobs, right? So trying to you know create a little bit of a uh, interesting, controversial, uh, exciting topic and uh, you know hold on to your horses because it's going to be really interesting so the next 20 minutes uh, is something you will you will you know really enjoy okay so this is the broad outline of the talk now uh, the talk has broadly two parts one is the boring part right uh, it's not that boring so uh, you know it's it, that's interesting as well so we'll discuss the definitions the discussion about ai itself uh, and then uh, the second part would be the actual practical part. We'll show you the work which we are doing, some actual work that we have done in the field of AI. And also uh, share with you some other useful AI tools available for you today, which you can start using uh, right after this talk. You can start using them uh, to improve and enhance your practice and clinical research. So that's the broad outline of the talk today. So let's start with the first part. Uh, that is everything about artificial intelligence, which doctors need to know, uh, everything about AI. Now, why this topic and why technology? Right? So if you see the field today, right now, you know, the world today, what is happening is there's an interesting dynamic change which is happening uh, in the world today. Now, uh, recently, you know, last year, 2022, I went to the American Diabetes Association, ADA. Uh, and what is interesting, there's something very interesting. So you have this, you know, uh, uh, the, the exhibition where you have the pharma exhibition and the uh, you know uh, a vendors exhibition which is usually there in most conferences so generally these conferences you know the exhibition is full of pharma companies uh, coming with new products and so on, so on. Uh, in india also you go to any conference you have the exhibition you have that exhibition part where you have a lot of pharma companies displaying their products and uh, services uh, what is interesting is uh, this time in the ada there were more technology companies than pharma companies one and the bigger stalls were all taken up by tech companies. And pharma companies were all sidelined and they were all you know, small, small stalls in some, some corner of the exhibition hall, which is very interesting. And if you see the pipelines also for pharma companies, the pipelines of pharma companies are very rapidly drying. Uh, often this is because of the fact that there's now less money, uh, less monetary push in the pharma space. And we all know that wherever there is money, uh, you know, innovation is often driven by money. And money is now flowing more towards technology. And especially within the space of technology, uh, AI and machine learning are the biggest development so far in the field of technology. So now there's a lot of money, there's a lot of uh, interest and a lot of efforts moving towards the field of AI, especially in the healthcare field. And I think AI and healthcare is perfectly fit for each other. So I think that is, that is why AI is very, very important and very, very essential for doctors to really understand uh, 
AI and, and to try to use that in their own day-to-day -day lives to enhance their uh, quality of clinical practice. Now, AI is currently very much in discussion. And this discussion really came from one big innovation, one big push, and that is Chat GPT. Now, unless you are living under a rock, I'm sure you would have heard about Chat GPT. Chat GPT, according to some technology people, is an innovation which can be uh, linked, or which can be probably correlated to the level of Gutenberg Press. It's a Gutenberg Press level innovation. It's a big innovation. Again, so much so that the Time magazine has actually put Chat GPT on its cover which is, I think, something which is remarkable. Why this is such a big innovation, why this is such a big step, if you use ChatGPT, you'll automatically know why this is such, such a great tool. But it's a, it's a first really commercially usable tool, which can, you know, which dazzles you with the power which AI has. And I'll actually show you how, you know, in fact, the power of ChatGPT itself uh, in, in the next few slides, how useful ChatGPT is and how, how, break, how big a breakthrough it is. Why compare it to Gutenberg level press innovation? Now, so you know that, you know, before the time of the press uh, was invented, what happened was that you had scribes, you know, the scribes who would, you know, uh, copy uh, textbooks and copy books and they will then distribute this book and copies and everything else. Uh, but what changed was that with the innovation of press, this handwritten manuals went away. I think the second level Gutenberg press innovation was actually Google or search engines, but Google in particular. And then the third level, which is now taking it further forward, is ChatGPT. ChatGPT is something which will, if done right, will break the information gap, the information uh, issues, the knowledge gap that a lot of our patients have. And it will actually bring AI right to our homes and right to our desktops and mobile phones. So there are a few terminologies you'll hear a lot about in future. Now, I'm not going to discuss too much in detail about these terminologies, but you'll hear about them a lot uh, in the coming days. So you need to be accustomed with these terminologies. You need to be accustomed with these, these words. Uh, and if you don't know, I think the best idea is that you go to chat GPT and ask them, chat GPT, what is artificial intelligence? So it'll give you the correct answer. It'll give you the right answer in a few lines. Uh, and you you would obviously you know, be uh, better equipped with that knowledge. But I'll also try to help you understand what terminologies you really need to understand. And a few uh, examples and a few uh, things which you need to know. So the terms which you really need to understand and hear, we'll hear a lot about it is artificial intelligence. You'll hear a lot about machine learning. You'll hear a lot about chat GPT. You're already hearing a lot about it right now. You hear, hear something about neural networks. This is very, very useful in medical field. Computer vision. Not only you'll hear a lot about computer vision, but I'll show you an example of computer vision, which you already use in our own, one of our tools which you are developing. And you'll hear a lot about large language models, and that is LLM. LLM also is something we are using uh, in our own uh, innovations, which we have done. Uh, and this is something which, again, you need to understand a lot about. Okay, so what does AI in general and chat GPT in particular mean for healthcare? Why is it important? Why is it, why is it so important for our field? So the reason why it's important is that AI, it, like I said, it is very useful to reduce the information gap, right? So our patients, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have, uh, you know, if you're a surgeon, uh, you know, your patients are not uh, equipped with the knowledge about the surgery. They don't know the potential complications of the surgery. They don't know the outcomes of the surgery. They don't know why the surgery is important for them. So the information gap is a big problem in our field. Uh, and hence, you know, you can use AI to reduce the information gap. But more importantly, you can develop better predictive models. Now, healthcare is often like gazing into the crystal ball. It's very important that we can predict outcomes in healthcare. That's why healthcare, you know, is such an important tool. And predictive outcomes in healthcare is something which you've all been doing for many years. So you, you know, you, for example, if you're a cardiologist, you'd have heard about Framingham risk score, right? If you're in diabetes field, you know that you know uh, if your HP1C is more than seven your risk of diabetes related complications are more. Uh, if you are in the field of hepatology, you know about FIP4 score, you know, you know about child score, child book score, you know, so all these predictive tools, we often try to make predictions. And what better, than, what better than AI to make better predictions? AI is in fact a perfect tool for making predictions. Another problem which it solves is that you are able to analyze big data much better. So there's a better data analytics within a few clicks of a button, you can get a lot of 
uh, information from your data. And this is a big boost for evidence-based medicine. So this there'll be a paradigm shift in how data is analyzed and AI for data, data analysis is something going to be going to become very routine. Uh, in medical fee, medical college, we had talked about biostats. I think biostats is out. Trust me, biostats is out. What you need to know is how to use AI to develop evidence-based medicine. Again, I'll show you some examples of how you can do that. And then with all this, you will be able to deliver healthcare at a larger scale. Remember, the problem in our country, we all talk about this, we have a poor doctor-patient ratio. And because of that, experts and expertise is not able to, you are not able to deliver that uh, to the homes of the public. And hence, uh, you know, this is where technology is really going to be useful, that you will be able to scale the healthcare delivery, especially using AI to a larger context. In that so then the question comes, and this is the, you know, uh, topic which we had today, Will AI replace doctors? Now, if you, you know, you'd ask me that, you know, uh, Om, if you're saying that there's so much AI that can do, then why do you need doctors? Why will, why will the doctors be required? Well, let me counter question this for you and ask you that you had Gutenberg Press. Did Gutenberg Press replace authors? No, in fact, it did something exactly the opposite. What the press did is that now, there were more people who could write and then publish their work and then disseminate their work to a larger public. And as a result, I think a lot of things change after the Gutenberg Press. And after the Gutenberg Press was invented, the field of knowledge and writing and authorship and books became center stage. Same thing happened with, let's say, now you know, now you have Amazon self-publication, right? So you can, you can now, if you write a book, if uh, Dr. Gaurav writes a book, he can, he doesn't need to require a publisher to help him publish it. He can use Amazon to publish his book, sell his book on Amazon Kindle, and uh, you know, uh, people like me can read his books uh, without requiring a publisher. So it removes the need for a publisher. Same question, let me tell you. So what I'm trying to say is that AI is not going to reduce your work. In fact, it will increase your work, right? Just like, remember, in this field, you are authors. You are the people who are generating the evidence. You are the people who are seeing the patients. You are the people who are writing prescriptions. You are the people who are performing surgeries, right? A tool cannot replace that. That's the very important thing. And most importantly, right, this is a field where the importance of humans is often understated, but humans are the most important area of people here, right? And even if AI can give you the evidence, the delivery of the evidence has to be done by you as a doctor. The second question, let me ask you, is that did Da Vinci, you know, you have Da Vinci now and your robotic surgery. Did Da Vinci, did the robotic surgery replace surgeons? No, no. in fact, it created a new field where surgeons are now trained in robotic surgery and they are able to perform better surgeries, more precise surgeries, uh, and in fact, generate more income also for themselves and for their hospitals with the use of robotic surgery. So what ultimately happens is that, you know, contrary to our belief, a lot of the times, this, these tools actually enhance our practice and improve our work rather than to reduce it. And always remember this point, jobs are never gone. Jobs always change, jobs always evolve. And people in companies that don't evolve, and that's always the rule of law, people in companies that don't evolve will perish. That's, that's very true. You know, for example, Nokia, right? Who would have thought uh, 10 years back that Nokia is not going to be around after 10 years? Nobody, right? We all use Nokia phones. Nokia was at home, at our homes, at a center stage. You know, you talk to a Nokia a phone, almost everybody had a Nokia phone, right? In 10 years, in a decade, there's no Nokia. The company has been, you know, wiped off literally from the face of the earth. Uh, in, in a decade. Why? Because they did not evolve. In the same way, though I'm saying that jobs are never gone, uh, or, or AI will not replace you, it's very important to understand that if you do not evolve, then it will definitely replace you. So that is something you need to be aware and you need to be cognizant of this fact. And in fact, my favorite quote is this, and this is something you should imbibe in your own life. AI will not replace doctors, but doctors who use AI will replace the doctors who don't. So this is very important. This is something which we need to understand and we need to be cognizant and we need to be aware of this fact. And if you do not understand this, you know, you are at a risk of being replaced by AI or somebody who uses AI. So that's something you need to understand. Of course, most importantly, you need to understand the fact that AI is a tool, it's a resource. It's like say an X-ray or a lab equipment or a CT scan or, or a fibro scan. 
right? It's a tool that we have in our arsenal. A fibro scan is not going to replace a hepatologist, right? No. It will probably not even replace a, a histopathologist. You'll probably still require a biopsy uh, as a gold standard to determine the fibrosis in a liver. So same way, this is a tool. AI is a tool. It's not there to replace you. It's there to enhance you. It will equip the patients, but it will also equip you towards delivering better care at a faster and larger scale. And that's something which is the priority and which is the most important thing. So this is the end of the first part. And these are the conclusions which I have for you. Take home messages for you. AI is a tool. It's a resource. It's not there to replace you. It's not there to take your job away, but it's there to help you do a better job. And remember, always remember that your job still can be replaced unless you evolve and start using AI for the betterment of your practice, because that is what your patients will demand. Right? Uh, five years back, when I or six years back, when I started my uh, practice in Ahmedabad, there are very few people who are using WhatsApp very effectively for their own clinical practice. But now, all of us, you know, all our patients inform our sugar values on WhatsApp. WhatsApp has become center stage. Why? We all evolved towards using WhatsApp because it's something which our patients demand, and hence we tend to, and you, you know, we need to use it. So that's the broad point as far as the AI is concerned. Now, let's move to the second part. And here, I'm going to show you some of the work that we are doing in this field. And uh, it's, you know, a lot, see, a lot of this work, consider this like as a, as a lab, as an experiment. These are all little bit tiny experiments that we are doing. Uh, they are often far from being a complete product, but eventually this will become a complete product. And these are all uh, commercial exper these are these are non-commercial experiments which do not, may not have commercial value. So these are all uh, little tools, little learnings, little experiments, right? So always you know think in that sense. Okay, so this is one tool which we have made, which is called Doctor GPT. Now, unfortunately, uh, we you tried to make an app for this, uh, and we we got a rude awakening, rude shock from Apple saying that we can't allow your app because it is very close to Chat GPT. And that can create a confusion. So you need to change the name of your service and your app. So it's soon going to be renamed and re-christianed as Codeman. Uh, so watch out for this. But currently, it's currently available as a web application called drgpt.co.in. Now it's a very simple idea. Simple idea is that using AI, you can actually determine what is the best specialist you should consult for your clinical or medical problem. It's simple too, right? So I'll show you uh, on the right side. You can see the example uh, of this happening. So uh, you, what you do is you need to put in the medical condition which you're facing or the symptoms which you're facing, right? So for example, let's say you are suffering from excessive vomiting, right? So you, uh, you know, write down excessive vomiting here. Okay, so write on, write excessive vomiting, you click on it, and then it'll ask you whether you need to see a specialist or whether you can see a general doctor. So let's say we want to see a specialist. So you click on that, and then it will give you the result whether what specialist you should try and consult. So here it says you need to consult a gastroenterologist for your excessive vomiting and so on, right? So you can type, try this out. It's freely available. It's drgpt.co.in. Uh, it's like I said, soon going to be renamed as CodeMed and we are soon coming up. In fact, by next week, we should have the app uh, on the uh, uh, site soon. But when it comes as an app, it will be it will be renamed as CodeMed instead of Dr. GPT. But currently it's Dr. GPT, so you can try it out. You can try out complex conditions also. Yesterday, somebody asked me, uh, whom should I consult for MRKH? M MRKH is mayor rokitansky chris kushner hoyer syndrome, which is a uh, condition where you have, you know, Mullerian agenesis. Uh, so, you know, you try this. Try try putting MRKH and it'll tell you what doctor you should consult. So that's, that's the idea, right? Simple tool, simple application. We are trying to basically develop more into it that, you know, uh, and the next step would be, that will suggest you the best gastroenterologist close to your home, uh, and then you can consult your relevant doctor. Uh, it's it's something that I'm sure if done right, probably will replace something like a practo. So that's one. The second thing we are developing, uh, we have already developed, and which uh, which uh, you know we already uh, submitted an uh, abstract also in one of the conferences soon. So this is a pre-publication thing. So again, uh, you know, please do not. Uh, widely share it you know you can you can of course use it for your own uh, use but uh, you know be careful about sharing it because it's under publication under a peer reviewed publication so this is something we are trying to develop we are trying to develop a computer vision model for thyroid nodule so what we want is that you can if you can take just the photograph of the thyroid nodule 
it should be able to derive what is known as a tirad score tirad score is the scoring which is done for thyroid nodule uh, not that it will tell you whether the nodule is malignant or benign because that's not something which you know we are into the idea is to give you the tirad score and remember tirad score is a well validated score in which you can you will suggest it that whether you need to do an fnac or not so the first step of towards tirad score is to see the composition of the thyroid nodule and you can see here uh, that we have been successfully be able to develop uh, as a tool so uh, you know if you just put upload the photograph of a thyroid nodule it will be able to tell you uh, the composition of the thyroid nodule right so i'll show you an example of that right so this is a photo we are uploading right okay so those not well versed with a thyroid nodule this is what you see this is a thyroid nodule here now this is a solid nodule right uh, i you know deliberately selected this nodule because a lot of people who are not trained in uh, uh, radiology or endocrinology or thyroid surgery probably will see that probably looks like a cystic nodule but it's not actually it's actually a solid nodule uh, and again our ai model successfully uh, categorizes this as a solid nodule right you can see in a few minutes after generate the report yeah so it says it's most likely a solid nodule and not only that will give you the confidence of it has in its own results and what we are able to find is that whenever it has confidence more than 52% it is generally right so we are able to find a cut off also and in this case again we agree to this so it validates this model so this is a simple computer vision model uh, we have made for composition of the thyroid nodule but we are working to the other step and within a month or so uh, we will be success hopefully successfully developing a model where just by putting this photo you will have the thyroid score in front of you and using this thyroid score then you can uh, uh, you know, judge how to work up this patient further. Okay, so this is another develop, and this is something which uh, we developed recently, uh, which uh, will really dazzle you. It's really useful. Uh, may not be very useful for surgeons, but for physicians, this is something which is going to be very useful. You know, a lot of times patients send us their blood reports, and uh, you know, they send it as a forward, as a WhatsApp. You know, your relatives will send you reports. So, uh, and you know, uh, we know with this, a uh, lot of labs, you know, Thyrocan and all that they do. Uh, a big plethora of reports right now you don't need to you know all the points which are there in the reports they're not relevant to your practice or relevant to you you just require a particular set of data for example you know let's say i look at a patient's uh, set of reports i'm looking at the patient's metabolic profile i'm looking at the fasting sugar i'm looking at the post meal sugar i'm looking at the hba1c triglycerides and so on so uh, what we did is we developed a, a application where you upload the uh, pdf of the patient's report right so this is a pdf of the patient report you can see the pdf here Right, so uh, upload the PDF. You enter the patient's uh, name. Let's say a trial patient. Right, so what it does is it extracts all the relevant uh, values which are there in the report. Right, so if you see in a second, this is what we'll do. So you see it's running over here. Uh, it's a little slow right now because remember this is just a test product. Right, so here. So what this did is that it extracted the important value. So I required a fasting blood sugar. So it extracted that value. Creatinine, HbA1c. Uh, there's other report was triglyc uh, was uh, TSH which was not there. LDL triglycerides and so on right so it, it derived all the relevant reports which I, I required for me and then you can save this as a, a excel file or a csv file right so it takes a few seconds and then saves this as a csv file let me just over this yeah so it saved this as a uh, the patient's name was trial and then you save this as a csv file there yeah, yeah you can see so it it extracted all the relevant values and uh, saved it as a excel or a csv file Right, which you can see right and i just want to show you how accurate it is so this is the patient's original report you can see the triglyceride was 90 the ldl was 78 you know fasting experience so on and you can see it has been successfully able to uh, extract the relevant information right so that's the idea uh, there was no uh, you know sgpt report so it did not show that it said zero and tsh was not there so, so you can customize this you know uh, let's say you are a hepatologist or you are a hepatic surgeon and a transplant surgeon and you require you know let's say the sgpt of the patient the ptir of the patient you can then customize this to get all the relevant data that you want finally uh, this is another tool which i'm very proud of in fact you know i've been uh, sleeping you know having sleepless night trying to develop this as a tool we are trying to develop the biggest uh, resource available for endocrinology uh, on this planet i'm sure you know this is going to be once if it's we are almost there once this is done this will be the best uh, resource for endocrinology uh, where you ask any questions in the field of endocrinology and it will give you the answer so this is the uh, endo ai uh, tool for example let's you know we have already uploaded a lot of data here uh, and you know uh, let's say what is we asked what is the definition of an atypical pituitary tumor right so here it gives you the answer atypical pituitary tumor is this this is the ki index 
uh, and so on and so forth, right? Again, uh, you can ask another question, what are the treatment options for atypical pituitary tumor? And uh, here it will give you the options, right? So treatment options are gamma knife, focal radiation, surgery, so on and so forth, right? So the point I'm trying to say is that we are trying to develop this uh, uh, based on a large language model, LLM. Uh, in fact, done right, this will, again, you know, I hope, will replace something like an up-to-date where you can get the precise answer, exactly the precise answer uh, uh, for the question you're asking. Uh, instead of going through a lot of literature and a lot of text, you will get the uh, answer which you're looking for. Right. So this is the Endo AI tool. Now, and we're making this as a uh, sort of correlation to this is the PubMed bot where uh, this is still under development. Right. So you, you know, uh, open PubMed, copy the URL link of any uh, PubMed uh, abstract that you want. And what this will do is it will give you the summary of the of the uh, abstract. OK, so again, this is still under you can, as you can see, this is still as a Python script rather than uh, uh, the, uh, you know, GUI product. So here you do this, right? So you we had this uh, article on vimpedoic acid and yeah, so what it did, it extracted the data on this, right? So it told you, you know, the strengths and weakness of the study, the relevant uh, uh, topics on the study. So, you know, vimpedoic acid is a statin alternative. Uh, you know, this is associated with low risk of cardiovascular disease, the strengths of the study, it has a large sample size and so on. So within seconds, it will give you all the relevant information on your, uh, you know, on, on the uh, topic, on the abstract, which you want to read. So you don't need to go through the entire article, entire abstract, it will it will just give you the relevant details. And then you can then use it, uh, it, let's say you're trying to make a presentation. So you take all this, copy all this, put it in your PPT, and here the extracted summary, uh, strengths of the study, weakness of the study, and so on, right? So Within a second, in fact, we're making this as a uh, Twitter bot. So you, you know, uh, on Twitter, if you uh, put the uh, abstract, it will give you all these things uh, as a Twitter thread uh, within seconds, right? So that is what we are trying to develop. And this is almost, again, we are almost there. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's a commercial value to this, but this is something, you know, uh, if a uh, lot, if you know, if you have someone who uh, has to present a lot uh, in conferences and so on, this is something which will help you immensely. So the idea is. Uh, we want to work together and, you know, uh, it's very important to collaborate. So in this field, it's, you know, uh, there, there are no lone wolves. We are all, uh, you know, uh, part of a pack. Uh, we all need to work together. And I think the best example is, so, you know, again, we need to learn this from the technology field, where there is this concept of open source. So if you see open source, and if you see nowadays, you know, even if you take chat GPT, it's, an it's a good example of a well-developed open source environment. So what, Basically, they do is that there are collaboration between different specialists working towards a common goal, uh, and everything is locally funded. There's no requirement for external funding, and uh, you know, uh, so we can develop this as an open source project. For example, you know, we already done this. You take insulin, for example. And insulin was invented by Benting and Best. Then uh, somebody from Denmark saw that this is very interesting, so they took that, uh, developed it further, and it became the Novo Nordisk company. Somebody from the U.S. took it and became Eli Lilly. So, so the idea is that. Uh, in, in our field also, we had examples of open sourcing. Uh, now in the world of technology and healthcare, we really need to develop open source applications where, you know, I develop something and then you, you with your skills, are able to develop this further. That's the idea. So how we can work together? Well, we are trying to develop a consultancy to incorporate AI into your research and practice. So if you are a, if you're a doctor with a particular set of requirements for AI, uh, we can see if we can work together. That's the idea. You can probably collaborate. So this is my email address. I'll put my email address over here. Dr. Om Nakari at the rate Madaris healthtech.com. So uh, you can shoot me an email. Uh, if you are, if you have any ideas about how you can incorporate AI in your practice, you can shoot an email. We can have a Zoom meeting and perhaps, you know, work towards a, a, a good solid goal, which you can do, right? Uh, you can, of course, you know, if you're running a research uh, uh, system or if you're, if you're a part of an academic institution, if you're a professor, uh, you are giving, you know, thesis topics to your students, or if you're also doing a lot of research, you can uh, use AI in your research. It's very important, useful because, you know, uh, these are your likelihood of getting publications in big journals is, is big. If you're using uh, this uh, in, in you know, using AI or machine learning in your practice, right? So these are some, for example, you know, in my field, you know, these are some examples which you can do as a research. You can develop a computer vision tool to detect diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, you know, you know, continuous glucose monitoring, right? So you can use better analytic tools for CGM. You can use machine learning tools for predicting insulin doses, uh, machine learning tools. So these are all doable. In fact, some of them we are already doing, right? So uh, these are some ideas uh, for potential research. So if you are somebody who is interested in any of these uh, areas and or in your own practice, trying to incorporate AI uh, for prediction, for detection, for computer vision and so on, so on, 
again let me show you so this what i showed you in the uh, earlier part was our own work but i'll also try to show you some of the other useful tools uh, available yeah. from elsewhere uh, so for example you know uh, chat gpt itself is very very powerful uh, in fact here i'm going to show you an example where you can use chat gpt to make your own website you do you know uh, if you are somebody who doesn't know how to code it's fine you don't need to learn learn to how to code in fact you can use make an html website of your own within seconds so this is you know let's say uh, this is what i did today morning within few minutes right so let's say i want to make a website so i'll say write me an html code html is the code for a, a you know web page so i want the title to be this the subtitle as uh, this and the address and the appointment and all that right so you tell this to chat gpt so here you can see how beautiful it is writing the code right so it's writing the entire code for the uh, website within seconds right this is magical in fact i'll show you this is a working code i, I in fact you know don't need to make any edits or changes to that so we to, we take that as a code step 2 we copy this code and you can put it in a text uh, file or or you know and save it as html right so you copy everything we copied all this code here and we saved this as a file right as a web website example uh, file and then you can see the website is ready within seconds right in fact you can go to chat gpt and start and here see you see the website right so this is it made this in seconds right within seconds it made this not only this what it did was it it itself you know detected said that you know probably you need to have a google link also so gave a google link and uh, you know made a button where you can click and get an appointment online right so this this kind of thing so uh, uh, beautiful it is right so you can in fact use chat gpt to write code uh, even if you are not an expert in code right so this is something which is which is quite remarkable right so chat gpt itself is very useful and another tool which i found very interesting uh, it's something you know why this because it is very something to what we are developing like the endo ai app this is called glass ai uh, uh, again give, let me give you a word of warning our tool is better okay this is uh, this is not as good this is you know probably if we refine our tool our tool will be better than this uh, in due course but here this is something you know if you just what it does is glass ai this is available you can check it out uh, so glass ai uh, you give a, a prompt where you give the patient's clinical condition and then it will give you a plan of action it will generate a plan of action for your patient for example let's say we type uh, give me a treatment plan for a newly diagnosed patient with diabetes mellitus having hp1c of 7.3% ldl of 150 blood pressure of 142 by 92 uh, and you do that and you can see here it's developing the treatment plan it's generating clinical plan and here right so it says 45 year old male patient newly diagnosed diabetes is these are the uh, things you need to do uh, fasting blood sugar lipid panel uh, renal function test ecg urine analysis uh, lifestyle modification oral hyperglycemication insulin which i don't agree 7.3 hp will not, not need insulin uh, blood pressure medication statin therapy it says that statin is indicated so the idea is uh, trying to tell you that you can actually develop a treatment plan try this with something in your own field uh, this is not our product so uh, you know uh, i don't come back to me saying that it probably works or does not work but the thing is it is called glass ai it's already available uh, like i said what we are developing is something uh, for endocrinology probably be more accurate than glass ai uh, and you know uh, here it made a mistake uh, that mistake will not be there in our system right so that's the idea okay so you can try this out and then some other AI tools I'll show you. This is called Predibot. Predibot is, this is the name, Predibot. Uh, it's a, a machine learning tool. So you can, in fact, if, even if you don't know coding, uh, you can just upload your Excel file and it can develop a machine learning model within seconds. It says minutes. In fact, it does this in seconds, right? So you can develop a, uh, uh, you know, a machine learning tool uh, within seconds without uh, knowing how to code. And this is something which is, I know not many people know about this. This is called Lookup. Lookup is a very useful tool if you're doing research then you upload your excel file and then you can generate all the lot of data you know you can generate roc curve and you can generate the uh, you know sensitivity specificity uh, so we did this for one of our own uh, abstracts you know in fact we did this for uh, i told you about our uh, you know our computer vision model for thyroid nodule we used this and it's very useful and uh, you know within uh, minutes we had all the data analysis uh, for our paper so you don't need to hire a biostat or a statistician to do all this you can do this yourself using lookup Right? And this is called GPT for Sheets. So if you're using Google Sheets, you can use chat GPT right in the Google Sheets. This is GPT for Sheets. And again, you can you know extract relevant data, uh, do the analysis and so on and so forth. Again, very useful uh, for a tool for uh, doctors who are especially into research. So the take home message from the second section is that uh, we are doing some small little work in the field of AI to improve the quality of care. You too can do it. And if you are interested in doing this, uh, please send me an email and we can consider collaboration and finally remember this from hg wells adapt or perish 
now as ever is nature's inexorable imperative, right? So you need to adapt or you will perhaps perish. And this is something we all need to understand and we all need to invite in our own lives. So this is uh, how to get in connect, uh, how to connect with me. Uh, there are two places where you can really connect. One is by email. Uh, this is an email address here. And you can uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, whatever I do, whatever I develop, whatever uh, is there, is there on Twitter. So you can, uh, you know, check it out. And, uh, you know, any new developments on what a lot of these fees which I showed you uh, would be uh, available for you on Twitter. So thank you for a patient listening. And thank you, Dr. Garo, for this. And we can take some questions and uh, your suggestions, your ideas uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ohm, for very insightful and um exciting uh, field of AI with uh, with medicine. So uh, before we open the floor for the questions, I would uh, I would comment a uh, few comments from my side. To my understanding, I would say our our intelligence makes us who we are. I mean, and AI will enhance our ability to do exactly the same. And, right. and so we are we are entering into uh, probably a different field of medicine where uh, AI will make us a uh, better doctor, I would say. And the second uh, is, uh, I think, more of imaging specialties like, you know, skin, pathology, radiology, only uh, they are the, I think, the first starter where we get uh, most benefit coming from AI. And yesterday, actually, I was, I'm a pretty naive uh, surgeon when it comes to AI. So yesterday I was, you know, looking uh, stuff for the surgery that yesterday I was, you know, researching and reading about, uh, about a bit about the surgery and AI. So what I found, uh, like, you know, the developments are happening where, you know, Dr. Ohm already mentioned that doing a large data-driven research, because now we are going on electronic record as a medical record. So, uh, so people are coming up with, uh, you know, predicting uh, patient outcomes in, in surgery. And they're also using AI to train surgical uh, education, so new fellow and residents. And they are also into, you know, this AI-driven application that Dr. Ohm already mentioned a couple of to make surgery more safer, I would say. So I think uh, for that note, I would open the uh, floor for the questions. If anybody has questions, they, they can ask questions. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, rather, Dr. Ohm. Uh, it was a fantastic talk and really okay. uh, elaborated the use of um, AI in medicine. Um, uh, let me be very frank. I have not yet used chat GPT. I may be living under the rock. <laughs> I've heard about <laughs> it and I've uh, had a look at friends who are using it. But I do see a lot of potential as long as we remember that it is a good tool. And there is always the fear like Marvel Comics that what if chat GPT wants to come alive and say that you do as I tell you, not as you think. So there could be a fine line there is one of my concerns. And secondly, Dr. Ohm, uh, we are, if you are uploading some data all the time, which could be a, a patient protective data, like sensitive data, patient data, which you have taken special consent for, how does it affect um, uh, the privacy is what I'm concerned about. So that is yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, I think both excellent questions. Uh, and, and, you know, so the first is, uh, the chat gpt itself and uh, you know whether it, it really wants to come alive and and to the extent to which uh, it can be used uh well the answer to this is that you know actually the sky is a little bit you know to be very honest uh development uh, you know you probably cannot stop it from being developed to the level but the point is that people who are developing AI, one thing is very clear that uh, see ai has been around for a while in fact you know you would say there is a uh, the development of artificial intelligence, uh, very interestingly, has been under development since the 70s and 80s. Now, what happened was there's a period of time where no development took place, which is known as the AI winter. Uh, there's a long phase, you know, almost for two decades where there was no development because, you know, what happened was that the visions were there, but the tools were not there for developing this, right? And now it's come back because now you have the vision and the tools, both the things which are available. So uh, that development, now the other thing which has happened is that in that 20 years time where there was an AI winter, uh, a lot of people in this field uh, started understanding how you could perhaps use this in an ethical and a safe way. So uh, there are a lot of already checks and balances in the entire system, which is making sure that AI is used in an ethical and a sane way rather than being used, misused in a, in a wrong way. Now, uh, that's that's already that those things are already in place. And that is one of the reasons why, you know, when you have any of these developments, there are a lot of checks and balances which are already taking place behind the system before it is presented to the uh, public for general use. 
so uh, now for example you know in the current situation right despite this what happened was that after chat gpt came there are a lot of academic institutions which started asking that you know whether my student whether my fellow is writing a paper is this paper genuinely written by him or is it written by chat gpt now what is interesting is that we don't know the answer right we cannot differentiate you can differentiate plagiarism right you can you can you know now you have tools in fact you ask chat gpt whether this this text is plagiarized it will tell you that it is plagiarized but you know what chat gpt does is it regenerates text on its own so its own text it cannot say it is plagiarized right because it is something which is regenerated so that's a problem right now the thing is that now there are people who are developing tools where they can probably identify based on a signature whether this is a text which is generated by chat gpt or whether it's a genuinely generated text so you know what happens basically is that people will uh, you know uh, sooner or later find a solution to these niggling problems so it's a work in progress now the second part of your question is very very important right that is whether what what happens to data of the patient because uh, you know this is something very critical and remember we are all in a field where data privacy is something very very essential and important so that is one of the reason why that is one of the bane of healthcare that you know we need to think about data protection in a lot more uh, nuanced manner rather than you know leaving it to uh, what you know maybe facebook is doing or you know uh, other things are doing so again uh, you know uh, anybody who is developing a healthcare system uh, associated with uh, ai uh, needs to have hipaa compliant uh, data services where you know uh, the uh, data privacy of the patient uh, uh you know whether the patient has uh, you know given you the permission of using the data for whatever purpose whether it's for research or whether it's for uh, you know personalization whether that is there or not all these things are uh, again uh, placed as checks and balances and any product so any of the things which i showed you today for it to come out as a commercial uh, product uh, all these checks and balances has to go and in fact any system you make uh, so whether you know whether i sell this as a software or whether I sell this as an application now if you see if you try to upload an app on uh google or on uh, android or you know on the on the apple uh, these things are already part of checks and balances so it asks me a number of ton of uh, you know privacy related questions it will ask me you know whether i'm collecting any health related data how am i going to use that data whether that data will be used by a third party so uh, there are already checks and balances in the system and because of this existing checks and balances uh, uh, you know i'm hopeful that uh, these issues uh, will be sorted having said that there will still be problems and there will still be uh, you know issues which will still arise eventually i'm sure uh, you know we'll iron out the problems and we'll we'll you know solve these issues also but these are very important and pertinent question and we need to understand this before uh, we need to fully grasp the importance of this before we really yeah thank you thank you um, any thank you, question from anybody else yeah so uh, dr om i have one question so i mean whenever we, we whenever we adopt a new technology i mean there will be a deskilling right we 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 tend to lose some skills that we have yeah. and then um, and then the new technology comes you just you know you lost the skill so how you i mean how will you handle that uh, deskilling that happens in in the field of uh, in, you know healthcare with ai yeah i think that's a very important question very good question i think uh, you know so deskilling happens let me give you an example uh, right now how many people's phone number do you remember exactly right? you don't right probably your wife's phone number you remember but <laughs> nobody else right you don't remember anybody else's phone number right uh, so you know uh, you you don't uh, but there was a time uh, not more than maybe a decade or two back where you'd remember every phone number or at least you know if not uh, write it down in a diary which you're carrying with you and you know whenever you want uh, dr goro's phone number i go to g and find your name and then you know call you up or if you somebody i call you every day i remember your phone number right that's what happens so deskilling for example has already happened to us that we are we have lost the art of remembering phone numbers uh, it has already happened right so uh, deskilling will occur it will happen right uh, even today uh, if you see uh, you know for example let's say the field of cardiology now since echocardiography has come uh, there is always a you know a lot of people who are saying that you know cardiologists are not very well versed now with uh, auscultation uh because of echocardiography because now they don't trust their own auscultation skills because they know so much about echocardiography that they feel that uh, this is an i feel it's an opening snap but in a cna echo the patient doesn't have atrial stenosis at all right so what do you do uh so i think you know probably let me say it is not deskilling it is reskilling because then you understand a lot of these skills uh whether it is it was truly relevant or not 
and if it's a skill which is truly relevant to your life uh, you will probably still continue to retain it right for example let's say if i see a patient uh, in front of me uh, and there are certain uh, clinical aspects of the patient that i need to understand and need to uh, you know imbibe and need to understand uh, see uh, if i don't do it uh, perhaps I, that patient will not come back to me and that skill of mine is going to be in but for example there's another skill for example you know uh, calculating a framingham risk score for a patient uh, i don't need to memorize it i can use that AI, ai tool which can help me do that and it can suggest whether i need a statin for this patient or not now delivering that statin to the patient and convincing the patient to use statin is my skill which i will not be de-skilled because i need to remember the skill to keep going forward so de-skilling will help occur it is there is no doubt about it right again there's not something we can do too much about it but the point is that eventually in terms of evolution what happens is that anything which is vestigial anything which you probably do not need to remember for functioning in your day-to-day -day practice you lose that skill probably that skill was not perhaps not important for you also that's the point right now maybe there's a world where everything gets destroyed and there is you know uh, if if, uh, if some of you have seen the last of us the series on uh, uh, you know uh, on hotstar currently where the world is destroyed by a fungus and you know uh, there is the world stopped uh, in 2003 there was no, no development after that so there is no you know you need to have skills of uh, having a map uh, having to read a map because currently nobody knows how to read a map right everybody knows google maps nobody can you know uh, i can't if i ask my daughters to you know point out where is uh, baroda on this map and where is amdavad on this map uh, they'll take take a while uh, maybe 20 years back this skill was something which was important so that these killing is always going to happen and god forbid if they require a skill google maps suddenly goes away and they need to start actually seeing maps or start asking people for direction then they will learn the hard uh, you know lesson about it but i think you know uh, whatever skill you require for survival i think you will uh, probably still retain that uh, those which you do not probably will get chucked off uh, which is i think part of evolution so i think you know uh, we need to accept that yeah so there are few questions in a chat uh, one shukta from mamc is asking what are the essential skills that students currently pursuing mbbs should learn to uh, be better technically versed and make better use of ai in medicine i think that's an excellent question a uh, very important question i'm glad that you asked uh, look you know as a doctor uh, you are trained to communicate with people you are you know trained to communicate with other human beings right uh, whatever you know or you are trained to examine to work with other human beings uh, that is that is part of your training right you are you are taught about you know uh, taking history from a patient uh, and then presenting the history to your uh, professor uh, that's a part of the training which is there now beyond this as a modern mbbs student uh, you need to also learn how to communicate with machines that is important right so you need to understand what machines understand and how to get data from the machine and how to extract information from the machine that is something that is a skill which you need to understand so my suggestion is uh, this is already happening my daughters are in a school where you know they already started teaching them a little bit of coding so uh, but we are of a generation where we passed that you know uh, nobody really taught us any coding in any great detail when we were in school and perhaps a lot of these things were not there but i think you need to probably as a student or if you have time you know it takes a few months uh, learn at least some basic of some coding language which which is which you feel is useful for you uh, just the basics so i showed you in that uh, presentation that you know you can ask uh, chat gpt to write a code for you in html but let's say if you hit a snag and if you know a little bit of html then you can edit the code i want to make the background yellow in color instead of white in color i don't need to ask chat gpt to do that i understand the code so i'll make the changes which which are relevant to the uh, code right so need to understand some basics of coding what is variable what's a dictionary what's a list what's an api call uh, what's a dic you know what's a json file those kind of things you need to understand and i think perhaps uh, of to learn that i think the best language we should you should learn is python because python is something which is i think it is a you know uh, python was something which is a very old language but it has come back again in today's world because of ai because most of the th tools which are developed for ai are developed on python so if you want to learn one med one uh, computer language uh, which is going to you know be useful for you even in future uh, is future proof to a lot of extent is python so learn a little bit about python you know open up a udemy course or you know uh, uh, ask your friends or read up a book uh, it will take you uh, trust me it will not take you if you spend 20 minutes a day it will take you about 3 months to learn almost everything about python 
right? Enough so that you can edit the code which is written by ChatGPT. That much you'll know, right? So that is a skill uh, which you should perhaps have. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure uh, if you have that skill, uh, you it will definitely it, to some level in your practice eventually help you, right? So that is something you should upskill yourself. Uh, apart from you know uh, communicating with your patients, perhaps learn a little bit of communicating with the machines. Good. So there is one more question from uh, Dr. Yash Shah. So he is little insecure about AI and chat GTP. Like let's say patients have questions and queries answered by chat GTP and also treatments. So patient might not come to doctors because they are getting everything they want. Okay. So two answers to that. First of all, patients already had that, right? For example, you take why chat GPT, take Google, right? Currently, uh, you can Google any information you want, right? So let's say I am having a, a you know a migraine. I say, what is the best uh, medicine available for migraine? So you say triptans are good. I say, okay, uh, Google this, right? You can do this yourself. Google this. Google yourself which uh, which triptan is the best evidence. It will say, let's say sumi triptan. Yes, I'm giving an example, random example, right? Uh, don't quote me on this. So uh, uh, you know, let's say it will tell you sumi triptan. Okay, fine. Sumitriptan is a good good uh, medication for my headaches. So I'll say, what is the dose of sumitriptan? So it'll say 25 milligrams. How frequently do I need to take it? So it'll say as on as per need basis. Okay, what are the side effects of sumitriptan? I will tell you, you know, uh, for GI side effect and this and that, right? So I have the, this is Google, right? This is not chat keeping. If I do this, uh, Google will tell me all the answers. So from tomorrow, I'll go to 1mg.com, write a fa fake prescription and order sumitriptan for myself, right? And start taking it. Right, so this this patients can currently do it themselves, but yet patients don't do this. Patients still come to you, right? Why do the patients come to you? Because remember, uh, this is one very important factor we need to remember, is that despite having technology and despite having everything at our disposal, probably the patient will come to you after doing all this Google information and will ask you and say that doctor, can I take? I heard about sumitriptan. Can I take sumitriptan for my migraine? Right, and then you can say probably yes, no, it's not the right drug for you. Maybe it's a good drug for you, you know, so on and so forth. So we are all remember still of an era where we still trust human beings more than we trust uh, the machines. Right, whether you like it or not, we are of the generation we where we trust humans more than machines. And because we trust humans more than machines, which is a good part, we'll always go back to your doctor or to somebody knowledgeable in the field to get an answer to the question. I'll give you another example. That you already have, uh, you know, uh, all these tools available where you can, you know, review uh, the patient, uh, review the, you know, uh, doctor's ability. For example, you search for Dr. Gaurav, and it'll show you, you know, Dr. Gaurav has 4.8 stars on Google My Business, uh, and so you know that, you know, uh, uh, he's a good surgeon. Uh, but then, if I want to get a surgery done by Dr. Gaurav, I still ask, uh, you know, my friends whether, you know, look, I, I, I saw on Google that his, uh, you know, rating is 4.8. But can I still get it operated by him? And there'll be a relative of mine saying, hey, hey, Dr. Gaurav, very good, very good. You know, you can go, you can go to him. So there's a validation. There's a human validation we always seek, right? Uh, whether it could be from a friend or a family member, see your own patients there. There'll be a subset. There'll be 10% patient who will come directly from Google, right? I saw your review on Google and that's why I came to you. But there'll be a lot of patients who will use Google, but then you will ask somebody uh, in that field that, you know, whether I should consult uh, so-and-so doctor or whether I should, I should do this. Human validation is something very useful, very important for us. And despite having the tools available and resources available for patients, uh, patients will still seek human validation. Maybe 20 years down the line, probably they will not. Who knows? But as of today, right, they will they will definitely require. And at that point of time, maybe 20 years from now, your, uh, you know, uh, skill or your your requirement, your your job as a doctor will probably change. Right, you will become you will be doing something else as a doctor, right? Just like a cardiologist currently is not is you know doing more echocardiographies than auscultating patients. Uh, that same way, you know, you will be using some other tool, you know, to uh, your patients will come come to you for something else. So, like I said, jobs evolve, but you know, you need to evolve with that. Otherwise, you know, you'll be left behind. But as of today, we all seek human validation. Without human validation, our world, our day doesn't go by, right? So that's why you know, uh, doctors will still remain relevant till we seek human validation. Very nice. So there is one more question from me. I mean, so as a, as a medical fraternity, do you think it's a high time uh, to change the, the coursework of the medical school? Because if you see there are a lot of things coming and we are just still hanging with the same course that we used to do for 25, 30, 40 years ago, the same books we are using. 
so do you think we should incorporate this new technology in the in the medical school itself so people or doctors are more aware about this technology in coming future what do you think about 110% right our course curriculum for medical education needs to be changed immediately uh, in fact it had to be done yesterday it's not being done right it requires upskilling it requires change and it requires relevance with time right uh, any field you take any field you take there is lot of you know you talk to a super specialist you reach a level uh, then go back to what you learned in your mbbs you realize lot of the things you learned in mbbs was junk and lot of the things you should have learned which you did not learn right that is the reality of uh, medical education today there is definitely a need to upgrade the course curriculum right uh, to make it more relevant to the time in fact i, I would say you know uh, your your uh, you know I, i'm not saying that you stop uh, teaching them clinical examination it's very important to learn, learn clinical examination it's very important but also teach them how to use the tools which are available to them for example teach them how to read a ct scan right teach them how to read a mri right teach them how to uh, read an ecg right even those things are not taught to students so that's so they are going to when a patient comes to them right with a potential clinical features of heart failure they will definitely do clinical examination and say that you know perhaps this patient has heart failure but they will also do ecg they will also do echocardiography and if they don't know how to report you know how to read a ecg or how to report a echocardiography or how to understand a echocardiography right then they will they will perhaps not be in a good state situation when they are in practice right so uh, we need to produce doctors who are upskilled with the current technology available it has to be done and it has to be part of curriculum right so medical curriculum these things have to be part of it uh, whether it is you know ai can be a good important especially machine learning machine learning has to be part of your uh, psm biostatistic criteria if it's not your biostats is irrelevant lot of the things you learn in biostats is irrelevant now right mm -hmm. let me tell you you use machine learning neural networks to teach these two things your your students will be able to do better research maybe and faster yeah so next question is from dr kirit kubavat he is asking in healthcare what do you feel is more important intelligence or empathy <laughs> i think it's a difficult question to answer it's it's a uh, you know it's a philosophical question okay <laughs> what <laughs> so what is important uh, whether whether you know uh, intelligence is important or empathy is important i think both are important both are, right i think you you can't have uh, yes there will be doctors who will have bit of little bit one more than the other some doctors will have more empathy some doctors will have more intelligence uh, some will have neither and some will have both uh, but you will always have people with differential levels of these two skills uh, it's a fine balance between these two skills between uh, the intelligence and emotional intelligence right so both the things uh, you know are equally important uh, both you need to you know be well versed with and it's important so remember uh, you know i'll give an example of uh, how things happen in in uh, the legal field for example law right so in law there are certain uh, lawyers who are very good at doing research right who will go through all the you know previous cases and you know they will do a a case mein ye hua tha wo case mein ye hua tha but they are not very good at arguing in front of the judge and then there are trial lawyers who are very good at arguing in front of judge but who don't know how to do research right so you give so what they do is they often work together so one of them does the research other becomes a trial lawyer and says that you know i'll present the research in front of the judge so same way uh, unfortunately as a doctor you know you could still develop a team where you know you have somebody who is good at research I and mean, you are probably good at your human skills but generally we need to have a split personality where you have one part of your brain doing well in terms of research and updating yourself but the other part of your brain also understands the human aspect of it has empathy has emotional intelligence and then hence it is able to deliver uh, a better quality care to your patient and i trust me over a long period of time if you take anybody's one decade of practice it's very clear that those who are doing well in their practice have both the skills in good proportion mm -hmm. otherwise you know they will not survive somebody with only empathy with no, no no knowledge or intelligence eventually patients will figure out that this guy is very good person but he's not a very good doctor and the other way around right nobody will go to somebody who is having lot of intelligence but no emotional skill right uh, patient will stop going to that patient because har bar you know ye 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 uh, facts batata hai lekin treatment nahi karta you know that kind of thing so anybody who is successful eventually will have both the skills in good proportion and you need to have 
Yeah, I feel uh, it's like uh, knowledge and wisdom. AI can give you all the knowledge you want, but at the end of the day, you need a human being to have the wisdom to judge whether the knowledge is correct or not and to apply it to your patient or not. There, I think uh, AI can, can never replace a human being. It should be yeah. a good tool, but not a master. <laughs> very true, very true. So uh, thank you, Dr. Om, for uh, coming to the session. And it's, this session was really very insightful, I think. And uh, we should take this uh, initiative forward. I think in, in future, probably uh, what we'll do is probably we'll, uh, uh, we'll create a you know, white paper for uh, you know, medical students and residents that you're already working on. I would like to be a part of that collaborative. And I think we should uh, take this uh, initiative forward, like what, what kind of skills, uh, either probably in AI or... Uh, you know, technology that uh, the students and residents should be having as a future, uh, you know, healthcare provider. I think we'll work on those projects. Uh, we'll create more awareness about AI and uh, we'll go from there. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, Dr. Gaurav, for having me. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you thank all you. for joining.